Okay, well, for those that don't know, I am Sasha Black, and we are going to be talking about pros in the market. One thing that I am really passionate about is uh, delivering to reader, and when most people talk about writing to market, they talk about the brand, the pitch, the package, and the marketing. What nobody seems to talk about is the writing of writing to market, so that is what I am super passionate about. But the thing is, we all write in different genres, and I can't read all of the genres, mostly because I just like smut, but um, so... <laughs> You all do too. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, but the point is then that I can't tell you exactly what it is that you need to do in your genre. What I can do is give you the tools to work it out yourself. And that's what this presentation is all about. Um, so, oh no, wait, it's there. Oh God, I'm not used to having two things in my hands. Um, so this is what we'll cover. We'll just go straight past that. Uh, awesome stuff, basically. What is going on? This is not, this is not great. Here we go. I'm going to have to stand here, aren't I? All right, so first a question. Who um, is in favor of or would like to be able to write to reader or write to market, however you pronounce it? Okay, good, good, okay. Um, who doesn't really want to do that and would just like to write um, frog erotica or whatever? <laughs> okay, well, hmm. <laughs> I still love you, Val. Um, <laughs> okay, that's good for me to know. Oh, this is going to mess me up. All right, so uh, before we dive into most of the content, I'd just like to give my definitions uh, of what I think prose is. So prose is language, and it refers to what is actually written on the page, those inky smudges between the pages. Author voice is slightly different. It means their style and kind of specifically refers to the things that they choose to do. So the tools they pick up, the um, uh, grammar things that they do, their little quirks with phrases, turns of phrases, things like that. And it's what makes them unique and identifiable. Um, purists would say it's just like grammar and shit, but I, I'm not a purist and they're wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, so before we dive into some of the tools, I want you just to think about voice and your career, because I don't think that any of us stay identical all the way through this. The one thing that we do know in this indie world is that change is the only constant. Um, and for a lot of us, we are artists at heart, which means we're also curious, which means we also want to do multiple things over the course of our careers. So voice then becomes something more. It becomes more than just the one genre that you're writing. It becomes the things that transcend genre and that follow you across whatever books that you're writing. And I think that that includes things like your tropes, your points of view, like, I don't know, who likes to write in third person, for example? Yeah, okay, who likes to write in first person? Who likes to write in past tense? Who likes to write in present tense? Excellent. Okay, so there's a real divide between who does what. And so for those of you who picked one of those, who was also written in a different tense or a different point of view? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so other things. We tend to become quite habitual as humans. We'll pick certain things that we do an awful lot, like me. I like, can't seem to not write enemies to lovers. I just like, I just, every time. Um, but there's things like the size of character cast. Some of us love like more intimate stories with just a couple of characters and some light loads. So anyway, you can see the list there. But what I want you to do is think about the authors that you choose to read. So like, I love Katie Robert. I think she is amazing. She gives me these fast paced, juicy, smutty, delicious stories. But I also love people like V.E. Schwab, who writes these sweeping, epic fantasy stories that are super deep and like, full of symbolism and like uh, theme and stuff. And I love both of those. And I actually want to be able to write both of those. So this is why it's important to pay attention to like what elements create that and what elements you want to take into your voice uh, as you go through your career. Okay, so like why does prose matter? Because a lot of the time we hear people say, oh, it's the story, it's not this, it's not that. You know, you can write crappily and people will still come with you. And like, that is true. But at the end of the day, people come to story for feels and vibes. And the way that they get that is through the written word. And so that, those are your tools. That is how you create it. Um, yes, so in other words, 
the prose is the most important bit. And everybody says to learn the craft, but then they don't actually tell you what that means or how to do it. Like, oh yeah, you need to like improve your craft. Mm hmm <laughs> And, and then like nothing, I'm gonna tell you. Um, okay, right, let's move on. No, oh, 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 I'm good, I'm good, good. Okay, oh, oh, this is a good one. So, Shane, don't cheat, because Shane's seen this before. Um, why does prose matter? Two things, so the M stands for something and the E stands for something. Who would like to um, break the rules and shout out, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Who would like to have a guess? What do you think M means? Mood, put in? Okay, and who, uh, it's not either of those, but close, <laughs> but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> meaning, meaning is what the M stands for. Prose creates meaning, right? What readers connect to in your stories is the meaning. Not the meaning that you're creating, but the meaning for them and what they are taking from your story. Because once you've let go of it, whatever meaning you are trying to put in is irrelevant because it's their perception and how they take the story. So what about the E? Who wants to have a guess at the E? Yeah, go on, you all won this morning. Bonus points for you all. So meaning and emotion, and those are the two most important things in any story. Like, yes, characters are important, but it is the meaning that the reader takes and the emotion that they feel, that is what they are left with at the end of the story. So how do we do that? All right, pros in the market. So I'm gonna give you a structure by which you can take away and go and do your own study and uh, your own deconstruction of your genres. If you want more detail, that's the book. Uh, but I'm not here to sell that, I'm here to tell you loads of stuff anyway. So, the first thing you need to do is deconstruct. The way that you do that, I hate to tell you, but you've got to read a lot of books, okay? Um, some people need to read loads. I tend to read like 20 before I start a new genre. Some people only need like three to five books. So don't feel like you have to read 20 in a genre. That's just me. I'm a binger and a like input whore so you know I'm gonna gobble up stuff most of my friends read three to five books that's a great um, starting point the reason you need to th read three to five is because when you find patterns if you see something happen twice in two books in your genre that's a connection it's not a pattern if you see it happen three times that's now a pattern. So you have to read at least three books uh, in your genre. I know that we're not supposed to give black and whites but that is black and white. Um, a little, okay, then you do your analysis, which we're going to go into more detail about. Um, some of the things that you would be looking at are um, genre, for example. So what are the patterns across genre? How do those patterns mi uh, mimic other books in the genre? Or how do they differ from things that are in sub-niches? Or, uh, you know, like how does fantasy differ, fan epic fantasy differ from steampunk, for example? What are the commonalities in pace, tropes, patterns, structure? And what are the differences? Um, then you can like go down and I'm, I'm, we're gonna, the next slide is going to give you like the actual specifics of this. But other things that I look at are characters. What are the similarities? Are there particular like archetypes that I'm seeing? So for example, maverick um, detectives in crime books had like a big, um, e uh, um, what's the word, like period of time. I can't think of what the word is. Um, yeah, what are the archetypes? How are the villains looking? Like, what do they look like? Are there any patterns or similarities there? What's the pacing like? For example, psychological thrillers, you'll find that the writing is much cleaner. There's not as much description. Um, and where there is description, it's cleaner and tighter than, say, fantasy, for example. Um, and that has an impact on pacing. Um, chapters are likely shorter than you'll find in fantasy. Um, yeah. Okay, and then things like uh, style, uh, oh, oh we've, I've said that, style of characters. Then I go even deeper and I look at the sentence level stuff. So patterns, um, looking at grammar, looking at word choices, looking at the tools within the sentences where they may have used like a juxtaposition or a metaphor, and I'm gonna give you loads of examples of this. But how do you know when to stop? How do you know like when you should deconstruct something and when you shouldn't? Well, on the previous slide, we talked about meaning and emotion, and you guys, yes, you're writers, but you're also readers. So the best time to deconstruct something when you're reading in your genre is when you feel something, like when something makes you laugh, or when, like, 
if you're me, you get like green eye and you're like, fuck's sake, I wish I'd written that. That's a really good time to stop and deconstruct. Um, or like, did you ever get that thing where you read a book and you're like, oh, I quit writing. Um, every time I read V.E. Schwab. Um, yeah, so like those are really good times to stop. Okay, and the slightly more negative times are when you go, oh, I really hate when X, Y, and Z. Or like if something annoys you or like there's a habit or tick in a, in a book or whatever, that's a great place to stop as well. And just work out, not just, like, not just recognizing that you're annoyed by it, but also why are you annoyed? What is it in the construction of that trope, sentence, dialogue, that has annoyed you, because that will help you level up your craft and make sure that you don't do that going forward. Okay, this is really messing me up. Okay, yeah, so just to solidify then the structure of what I do, I look at market level. That means I study Amazon. I am on the Amazon top 100 uh, every single day. And then I also go to my specific category, top 100. I like to look in the Amazon top 100 because you can spot trends. You can see what things are coming up. And usually whatever happens in the top 100 will then start to filter down into the niches. Um, and so that's a really good place to start. And it takes me literally 30 seconds. I literally just scroll. I don't do anything else particularly. So it's not really arduous. I then do exactly the same in my specific uh, category as well. Um, then there's other things at the market level. So looking at like, how does it sell? Does the author do Facebook ads? Are they doing Amazon ads? What's their platform? Are they TikTokers? Are they BookTok? Uh, that's the same. Are they Instagrammers? Uh, do they have no presence at all? Do they do direct sales? Like I literally deconstruct, I'm a stalker. Um, <laughs> don't tell my mum. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I do. I do go and stalk everything that these people are doing. Uh, not because I want to do what they're doing. I don't. I want to do it my way. But it gives me data and it gives me information about what is working and what tactics I can take and do my way. Other things really important to look at, reviews. Reviews are the readers. They are the people who are purchasing. Like Their words and language that they use in the reviews are like critical pieces of information because you can take their words and put them, um, like for example, if they say uh, it was the pacing of that first kiss or it was the, um, I literally, I can't, my brain is, I haven't had enough coffee, but you know what I mean? Like they'll talk about a particular trope that, and if you see that, what did I say, more than twice, if you see it three times, three, three different reviewers having said it three times, you probably should pay attention to that. That is a piece of data that you need to include. Um, or not, if you don't want to do it this way, uh, in your books. Uh, brand package, looking at coloring of the book covers, all of that stuff. All right, then at the book level, I start at the top. So story structure, three act, is it following a particular um, trope uh, structure? I look at the types of character, how many characters, is there like a best friend, an ally? Is it a hero's journey, a heroine's journey? Um, what are the tropes? Is there found family? Are they doing uh, like one big uh, fake dating, for example? But then what are those little micro tropes in the scenes that I can then put in mind to use for marketing? I've got a whole slide about how you can take tropes and use them for marketing in your prose, out of your prose. Um, other things like density of description, styles of prose, are people using cliffhangers? Really, really great place to look for cliffhangers in books, like not at the end, obviously, because that's where everyone does it. Um, end of the first chapter, end of the third chapter. Check those two. You can usually do that on Amazon, the look inside, or the other stores and their look insides. And the reason people do that, it is a strategic choice, because if people have read look inside, you're going to hook people in the rest, and then they're going to buy. Um, yeah, and then other data. Just take a screenshot of this because these are like all the things that my, my competition brain goes to like analyze. And then as I've said, once I've done all of that, and I do do it in this order as well, I then go down to the sentence level. So I'm looking at devices, um, cleanliness of like uh, prose description, uh, dialogue, are the voices different? Uh, I look at things like quirky footnotes. Anyone read Jay Kristoff? Okay, so Jay Kristoff uses um, footnotes all the time. I love them. They're super pretentious. Oh, it's just like my favorite thing ever because it's so voicey. Um, okay, all right, let's move on. D mimicry. Everyone hates and talks about mimicry, like copying. Don't copy. We're not copying. Mimicry gets a really, really bad rap. But if Neil Gaiman says it's okay, then like, you know. Um, <laughs> 
So for those not in the room, what this says is most of us find our own voices only after we've sounded a lot like, no, like a lot of other people. Um, and really, we are a product of what we consume. So <laughs> there is no original romance, right? Every romance ends in a HEA. Like there is nothing original about that. But what is original is our voice the meaning and the emotion. That is what our uniqueness will give to our readers. So how do we look at what people do and take it from our own? So this is the first example of deconstruction. So this sentence, it's guilt, reaching long fingers into the soft underbelly of my mind and letting the guts spill out, comes from the book, uh, A Lesson in Vengeance by Victoria Lee. So what I do when I find something that I like is I go, oh, no, I don't really. Um, I, go, <laughs> I try to identify what this person has done. So I'm like, why did I like this sentence? I loved it because she broke <laughs> rules, right? She told me the emotion. We always get told not to um, like identify emotions. And in the second word in this sentence is an emotion. That's telling, right? Guilt, she's told me the emotion. And yet it works, a clever bitch. <laughs> um, the reason it works is because she, she flips the tell on its head and then personifies that emotion. Why does personification work? Because it's action, it's agency. She's giving that emotion agency and that is characterization. She brings it alive. This is so clever. Um, so, okay, that's great. We now know that we could tell, and then we can give, uh, we can personify the emotion and give it action. So those two things are tools, and you can take those and iterate it and make it look like whatever you want. So I'm gonna show you how. All right, so the original one, it's guilt reaching long fingers into the soft underbelly of my mind and letting the gut spill out. So I did, I used the same structure and the same tools, and I have a sentence that is completely different. It's fear crawling under my ribs and kicking the ivory cage until my lungs splinter and my breath runs dry. There is no way anybody can say anybody's copied anything. And yet what we've done is we've deconstructed what that author has done and used the tools in a completely different way. This is how you get to take all the tools that your favorite authors are using and make them your own unique tools. <laughs> okay, let's do more deconstruction. So how, do you, how did I do that? Like, how did I deconstruct and, and find out what the tool was? Basically, I just break down these sentences into the smallest units that I can possibly find. And I'm not like a literary professor. I don't know all the fucking terms that you're supposed to use. Just make shit up, literally, all day. So um, I like call this stuff my own random names, and it makes sense to me. So like, you just do that too this best lesson ever. We just got told to do whatever. Um, okay, so another example. This one is less about like a juxtaposition or a metaphor and more about um, the structure of the sentence. And so what I loved about this, it, well, and the sentence is, when I hear that she's dead, I run. And this is the first line in a book. I'm like, I like love first lines. I'm always deconstructing first lines. But what works is that this is a shocking revelation, right? We don't expect to start a book with um, somebody dead already because we haven't met the character, right? So that's quite unusual, so that caught my attention. But then the thing that really worked for me is the fact that she subverted the, my expectation on a character's reaction. If somebody passes away, you expect them to cry, right? She didn't cry, she ran. That was shocking. Therefore, it was like, it was like a wow factor to me. Um, so, you know, shocking revelation plus unexpected character reaction. That's, that's the tool, right? You could do that in any way that you want uh, without copying those exact words. All right, let's go on. This is one of my favorite ever character descriptions. And this comes from a award-winning story. And I have permission from Alex to share this as well because she came on my podcast and uh, she told me exactly what she'd done. She says that she doesn't usually use formulas formulas for character description. But in this instance, she did. So it goes like this. 
There have only ever been two kinds of librarians in the history of the world. The prudish, bitter ones with lipstick running into the cracks around their lips, who believe the books are their personal property, and patrons are dangerous delinquents come to steal them. And witches. <laughs> I mean, I literally threw the story across the room because I was like, well, I'm never going to be able to write that, except I can, because I know the formula. <laughs> um... Okay, so what does she do? I asked her and she told me exactly what she does and now I'm going to tell you. Oops. All right, so the first thing she does is she says that she can never have heard the description before. That's really hard because we've all read a lot of books, but you can, I believe in you, you can do it. So it's got to be completely unique. And what stuck out to me about that description is it was genuinely completely unique. So we don't need to deconstruct that anymore. It's very obvious from the, the description itself that it was uh, unique. So the second thing that she said that she did is that it has to tell her something specific about that person and not just a physical uh, specific. It needs to tell them, the reader, about the character, about their, who they are in their soul. And the bit that it does that is where she says, uh, so the, the physical description is the prudish bitter ones with lipstick running into, their, uh, into the cracks around their lips. So that's the physical uniqueness. Then the bit that tells us about the core of the personality is her opinion, the character's opinion, right? Who believes the books are their personal property and patrons are dangerous delinquents come to steal them? The reason this works is because it's an extreme opinion. Like, your characters shouldn't have bog standard opinions, right? Nobody gives a shit if they like reading magazines. But somebody might care if they're tearing a page out and burning it, you know? <laughs> like, you've got to take these things a little bit over the line. Rebel. Um, it's like a theme for me. Um, and then the last thing that Alex told me is that whatever your description is, it needs to feel true. True in that maybe you could actually meet a person like this. Maybe there is, like, and who, like, honestly, I don't know that I've actually met a librarian like this, but I feel like I have, so like maybe I did one time. Um, and I'm sure you all like agree that that is a thing that you may have met. So yeah, anyway, this is an amazing formula and um, steal it. Okay, another one, uh, intangible, tangible. I just made that up, that title. I don't know if you can tell. I was really proud of it. Um, so one of the purposes of description is to make really unrelatable things relatable. Okay, so taking these complex, difficult topics like the theme, the symbolism, and then making it understandable and relatable and connecting readers, like creating that meaning and emotion. And uh, V.E. Schwab, always V.E. Schwab, has done that twice in, uh, actually much more than that, but in the is Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Um, and there's a couple of sentences, so let's deconstruct it. Her first one goes, and there will be a moment, brief as a yawn, where she won't know where she is. So the intangible bit is the moment. Like, what actually is a moment? Can anyone actually define a moment? Actually, somebody did try and define it for me, and they said it was like 90 seconds or something. <sighs> I don't know. I, I don't know. Anyway, so um, uh, a moment could be like, like, I feel like this whole conference is a moment. This week is a moment. There's a lot of endings, a lot of beginnings here, a lot of change for all of us. This is a moment, but also, like, just yawning could be a moment. But that's the point. She takes that indescribable concept and she grounds it in something that is universal. So she's taking the intangible and making it tangible, and that's how we all understand it. It's such a recognizable concept, a yawn. And then she does it exactly the, si the, the sign, Becca sign, no. She does it exactly the same in the second sentence where she says, she lies there, perfectly still, tries to hold time like a breath in her chest. Well, time is intangible. We can't, like, I, it actually hurts my brain if I even try and think about what time is or, like, infinity. Um, I'm just not that clever. Um, and then, so she relates that to something that has a, f like a visceral connection to something that we all understand. Like, if we all take a breath, it feels in our chest. It has like a, a, a physical, visceral, sensorial feeling that we all understand. So yeah, intangible, tangible is another tool. I'm going to skim through this one, but basically have a bit of fun when you find your favorite sentences um, 
remove the voice, right? So far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun. <gasps> um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But the point is, you can remove voice so quickly just by changing like one or two little things. So in the arm of a distant galaxy is a small sun is exactly the same sentence. It says the same thing, but it sounds completely different. And so I think it's really cool to just play and like eradicate some of your favorite sentences just to see like what elements create that voice right so that can teach you something just as much as taking the tool and deconstructing it can all right we all know about copywriting in terms of our marketing our tags our hook lines but why does nobody ever talk about it in the book because copywriting is like the um uh holy grail of useful tools for you guys and I am seeing it more and more and more um, in books hang on I'm like this is like real dry here okay so yeah copywriting is basically the act or occupation of writing text for the purpose of advertising or some other forms of marketing so you might be going yeah but Sasha why would you do that in your book well because you want to sell the next chapter and then the next chapter and then the chapter after that, and then when you get to the end of the book, you want to sell the next book, right? So why are we not making more use of this? There are a few places that I'm seeing copywritten text, and I really want to see you guys start to do this more and more, because I think it is just gold. All right, so end of chapters, starts of chapters. You want to hook them in. Primacy and recency effect is a psychological term. It's what the only things we remember, basically. You won't remember any of the shit I say in the middle of this, but you'll remember what I said at the start and what I said at the end. Um, and then, of course, the last line in the book as well. So let's look at what that actually looks like. So I went and I studied the top 100, um, and, or a there was a couple of books that were out of the top 100 when I did this, but um, had been in the top 100. And I went and looked at their first lines, and would you believe they were all copywritten. Um, so let's have a look. It's a sad truth. This was fantasy romance. It's a sad truth that most relationships are doomed. Wait, what? That is such a hooky line. It's unexpected and it's subverting our, cons our societal concepts of what relationships are, right? So that is why it's hooky. That is why it's copywritten because it's short, it's punchy, and it delivers like a powerful, unexpected sentence. That is marketing if ever I have seen it. Okay, the next one, Dark Contemporary Romance. Uh, this is by Hooked by Emily McIntyre. It feels different than I thought it would. Killing him. Oh, what? <laughs> you naughty bitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the cool thing about this is that uh, she also plays with punctuation, right? So long sentence, short sentence. When you play with punctuation in that way, you are, um, it, it's almost like a seesaw rhythm in the book, and that speeds up the pace, which makes the reader drop down the page faster, which means you keep them reading longer. Super great trick. Um, but also contra controversy in that first sentence. I want to know who she killed, or who he killed, actually, uh, and why. Um, so the next one, I'm officially broke, divorced, homeless. Punctuation play, three things. There's the rule of three, right? We're always curious about that. But also, this person is in a really shitty place, and we're all nosy bastards, and we want to know what's wrong. Great copywritten um, text there. And then last but by no means least, least, psychological thriller. If I leave this house, it will be in handcuffs. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> But it gave me the question, right? And I did want to know what they'd done. Again, copy written. First lines can be so potent and so powerful. I really recommend you go and deconstruct some and see um, uh, why they're working. All right, so I mentioned primacy and recency. So we looked at first lines, end of the first chapters. So I went and got uh, uh, a couple of ends last lines in first chapters from two books in the in the top 100 so Katerina Moira was on the panel yesterday uh, I hope she doesn't mind using her sentence it is amazing though um, that all changed when I took Hannah with me to Sierra's 21st birthday party I remember that night vividly I saw him first but she's the one he never looked away from oh <gasps> right so this this tells you what the character wants it gives you the meaning to the character and that 
hooked your emotions in because we all secretly want to be seen. We all secretly like want to feel seen and accepted. And that's exactly the opposite of what happened to this character. And that is the last line in that sentence. There is no fucking way you're putting that book down when you read that sentence because you know that that character is going to feel something. They're probably going to be cross and they're going to, you know, do naughty things. So that hooks me in. Um, and then Morgan Bridges, Once You're Mine, uh, she's a mystery, a problem, one that I intend to solve and be rid of, no matter the cost. And that's the key line, right? Because we know that this means that it's going to go to the extreme. Or else the price, price I'll pay will be my sanity. What little remains? <sighs> <sighs> oh, God. Sometimes I just... I love prose so much. Um, but the two, I'm such a nerd. <laughs> um, so no matter the cost and what little still remains are like these two little uh, teaser hooks for what's coming. They are um, hooks, they're promises to the reader. What little remains, which is a promise of either going to get rid of the rest of what remains, or maybe it's a journey to recovery. We don't know, but it gives us the question. It's copy written. All right, so I asked Morgan Bridges if uh, I could use them as a case study in here. And so uh, we talked through her book and what I think is, what I think the authors in the top 100 are doing are they are baking in the marketing uh, in order to like, uh, what am I trying to say? They're baking in the marketing as they're writing and they're allowing it to influence their prose. So how are they doing it? Okay, so this is just one example. This is a stalker romance. It's a dark romance, right? I can't do all the genres, but hopefully you can see what the deconstruction looks like and do this in your own genre. So irony. Uh, Morgan uses irony by... Um, she has a scene where a very possessive male forces another male to apologize to the female. This is very expected, right? The first male touched the female's hair and the possessive stalker male didn't like that. So he makes the male who touched her apologize. This is very expected, but then she levels it up and makes it ironic by making the person who touched the girl apologize to him as if she was her property. But when you think about that, this is a stalker romance, right? Belonging, possessiveness and property is the whole emotion around that stalker trope. So she's buried this in her scene and then she can take that scene and put it on TikTok or Bookstagram because that's the meaning and emotion that the readers of that particular genre wanna take out. It's fucking genius. Um, okay, so another thing that you can do with tropes then is to make them way more extreme than what the reader would expect. So how far can you take this? Touch Her and Die is a great example. This goes across a bunch of different uh, genres. But in this one, um, what, what the stalker did, and sorry for anyone who's like squeamish, but um, the threat, there was a threat, touch her and you die, like touch her again and you die. He, he did. And then he didn't just die. The stalker like nailed his hand to his own pub bar and then burnt the bar down. It's quite extreme, right? But also, what a scene for TikTok. People are like slathering over this shit. <laughs> Not me, I'm a good girl. <laughs> I'm also a liar. <laughs> then you can subvert the trope. There are certain expectations. You all understand that there are certain expectations uh, in tropes. So one of the, the expectations for stalkers is that the stalker will insert themselves into the character's life. But um, Morgan subverts that. So instead of, well, no, the stalker does insert themselves into the um, victim's life, but inserts himself by making, by helping the victim find her stalker. All right, so she's completely subvert. I know, right? <laughs> she's such a clever girl. Um, anyway, so that's genius, and it's subverting the expectation. It's not just inserting into the life, it's taking it in a whole new direction. And then you can also uh, use tropes and give them consequences. So, um, 
the question is like, what is the unexpected consequence of a trope that your readers wouldn't be expecting? Um, and if you're doing this before like 70, 75% in your story, then the consequence should be some kind of difficulty, obstacle, or like complication, right? Because the characters aren't through their character arc yet. So in her book, she's got the stalker watching uh, the victim lover whilst on camera doing um, self-care. And uh, the expected trope, that's expected, right? That he will watch her on camera. But the unexpected consequence is that he nearly crashes his car. Too right, too. But um, the point is, like, there's an unexpected consequence to the protagonist at that point. Okay, so bake the marketing in. The other thing that I want you to do is think about quotable sentences. Think about the individual words that are associated with these tropes. So like for stalker romances, possession, belonging, your mine, I own you, right? All of these kinds of words are really, really salient to the meaning and emotion of this trope. Think about it for your own tropes. Think about it for, um, you know, enemies to lovers or, or whatever, your maverick detective, okay? There are words that belong to tropes. You need to include them in your stories and in your scenes because those scenes then become your marketing tactics on social media and in your adverts. All right, juxtapositions. My favorite tool in the history of the universe ever. So a juxtaposition is when you place two contrasting things together, like either side for the purposes of comparison. Um, and it can create meaning and emotion. It's almost like there's a theme. Uh, but story itself is a juxtaposition, right? The beginning of the story is the opposite to the end of the story. Heroes and villains, good and evil, themes, characters even. All of the, so I find that there are two different types of tropes. There are tropes with stru like story structure within them, enemies to lovers. We know what the beginning of that story will be and what the end of that story is, fake dating, right? There is a story structure in that. And then there are more like micro tra tropes that I would say that are scene level, so like only one bed, for example. That will only happen in one scene. So um, ju the, the tropes that have the innate structure are usually juxtapositions, enemies two lovers, those two things are polar opposites. Fake, that you can't fake actual date. Um, but what some of these authors in the top 100 are doing is they are then taking these juxtap juxtapositions and using them for their marketing, in particular, their taglines and their hooks, um, as well as their first sentences. So uh, one of the best hooks, like historically in the indie world, you may or may not know Adam Croft, comes from Her Last Tomorrow. Could you kill your wife to save your child? Right? Kill and save, two opposite things. Also makes it the most hooky sentence ever. But the last thing that I wanted to say about juxtapositions is that most viral TikToks are some form of juxtaposition. Okay? Go deconstruct them, I dare you. Okay, so just some quick examples then. Um, her father's work is beautiful. The wood smooth where his hands are rough, delicate where he is large. This kind of juxtaposition creates a real intensity in imagery. Um, and like another example of that at the character level would be like Spock and Kirk. They are two completely polar opposites. But what that contrast does is it makes the two characters' personalities even bigger. Um, the Ishwab again. Uh, character, uh, creating voice and opinion. I have a theory. Oh, oh no, sorry, that other one was V. Ishwab. This is The Hating Game by Sally Thorne. I have a theory. Hating someone feels disturbingly similar to being in love with them. Love and hate. Two polar opposites, a juxtaposition. Um, and then I'm going to keep going because we've only got a couple of seconds. Um, so, creating setting, you can read this uh, later or take, take a picture. All right. Um, and then I talked a little bit about white spe uh, pacing earlier on and about using short sentences, breaking the rules with what is allowed in um, grammar and punctuation, right? We're always told that a sentence needs like a subject and a... Blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't follow the rules. But the point is, <laughs> okay, um, when you play with structure on the page, when you like do a one word sentence or a two word sentence after a long paragraph, you are dragging that reader down the page. This is considerably easier to read than something that is just a block of prose on there. Um, you know, we're not at school anymore. You can do whatever the fuck you like in your book, uh, including break all the rules. So just... Yeah, think about where you can do this. 
the good places to do it, in my opinion, it might be different to yours, are places where it's highly emotive. So action scenes, you want to like have, if you have the more shorter sentences, you're, you're going to make that action scene feel faster. Even though it's action, it will feel even faster. Um, like, yeah, so those fight or flight or also highly emotive scenes. All right, I think five minutes for questions. Silence. <laughs> Any questions? No? Okay. There is a little, I'll leave this up. Yep. You have to come to the mic though. Sorry. That is a rule you can't break, I'm afraid. So I loved what you said about the white space on the page, um, because that's something that I like to play with, but it seems to be something that editors hate. Fuck so editor. how do you get past the people editing your book that keep wanting to keep you from breaking those rules? You say no to them. Okay. Yeah. Say no. It's your book. It's your story. And at the end of the day, like if you are making intentional choices, here's what editors like to get rid of. They like to get rid of the unintentional choice, right? So that's why when you see, there's like loads of different types of repetition in story. Um, and what you usually find is if somebody's repeated themselves twice in a relatively short space of time, it's probably a mistake. Two is a connection, three is a pattern, right? So when somebody repeats themselves three times, like say they're using a word three times for effect, mm -hmm. the editor won't remove that because it's an intentional choice and it feels intentional. That has a rhythm to it. So I think if you are um, being intentional about those choices, then you, the editor should be picking up on that. Um, and if they're not, maybe it's a conversation you want to have to them or you find a new editor or you just say no and you don't accept that change because it's your book and you are in the power to make the final decision. Thank you. I have two questions, if that's okay. Come um, closer, my darling. Oh, can you hear me now? Um, closer. So, closer? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm a romance author, but geez. Ooh. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm a lesbian. No. <laughs> it's fine, I'm married. <laughs> Me too, we can talk later. Okay. Um, so when you do the reviews, do you ever use the, um, just for a quick glance, like the word clouds that appear at the top of the Amazon reviews, just like instead of having to read all of them, is that just an easier way to like hit it? Yes, you through. can, but I, those word clouds are very generic, and sometimes there's real power in the specificity of the way that the um, reviewer is writing things. And sometimes, like for me, I'm a bit of a cookie monster, so I want to read like, you know, 20 reviews, 30 reviews, and then I kind of just consume all of the wording and then take the vibe and feel away and uh, then sometimes it's about looking at a specific trope for example so for example in my girl G game series um, I know that one of the things that a lot of the reviewers were saying in books one and two is that they wanted more world building so I did that in book three uh, because I saw it repeated across those two books and now most of the reviews are saying the world building is great in book three right so that's where the power comes from is like those tiny little changes so yeah I do look at those word clouds but I actually find the benefit is in the specificity of their the reader's wording and also because you can use that wording like in then in your marketing because there's certain things that they're after and then you can take those like like it's a certain scene or it's a certain vibe or feeling and then you can literally steal the words and use them to promote the book um, so then what about um, when you're deconstructing books you know you're going from the high level down to the there's so many books to choose from. Which one's the ones that you were like, oh, that is definitely the book that I'm going to sit here and deconstruct now? Great question. I go to my genre. I go to the top 100 in that category. That uh, So the category that I'm going to put my book into. And then I take um, a look at the top 50 in that 100 and I look for the indie authors do not deconstruct trad books deconstruct indie author books but you don't want to just deconstruct any you want to deconstruct those ones that are 
actually selling. So um, make sure that they, uh, like if they've been out a while, have they got a good amount of reviews? Have they got, you know, over 500 reviews? What's the review level? Um, are they still selling? Like I hate rank, it's so arbitrary. It doesn't necessarily reflect everything that you need it to, but it's a good indicator. So is the book above 10,000 in the store? Um, if it's above 10,000 in the store, it means it's selling a good quantity of books every day. Um, you know, if you're an author who's already selling you know, in the top 500, you want to be deconstructing things in the top 500. Um, if you're a mid-list author, deconstruct things that are just like a little bit above you. But make sure that they are selling. Make sure um, that the, that the, the reviews, reviews are relatively high. I think that's it. All right. I have a lot of love for you Aww. in the virtual audience. So if anyone well, looks at the you. Facebook post, just know there's a lot of love. And um, Kel, who is watching you at 4 o'clock in the morning from Australia. Legend. Has a question. Love you, and Kel. And Kel asks, does it make a difference if it's character-driven or plot-driven? Um, no, I don't think so. I think it makes a difference if you are not delivering what the reader wants. So if you're going to, like, for example, if you're going to write a thriller... <laughs> I'm going to say this and probably mess it up because I don't actually read thrillers, but I'm going to assume that most thrillers are plot driven. So if you then write something that's super character driven, you're probably making a mistake. So it always comes back to what is selling because whatever is selling is what the readers want. So that is where I focus my deconstruction and then I go and do that, but better. I'm not competitive. <laughs> Thank you.